went through a, a rather an uncomfortable procedure about two and a half weeks ago. I had eye surgery, had a macular hole in the back of my eye, and they've got to go through quite a exercise. They put an instrument into your eye, yeah, and <clears throat> take out what they call the virtuous gel that's in your eye. Then they go into the back of it and they replace, they, they go and, and pull back a membrane and put a little patch in there, however they do that. I was awake during the whole procedure and I listened to the computer talking to him because it's such a delicate operation. The computer was telling him how much pressure was inside the eye and how, how where the instrument was and if he's too close or too far away. It was fascinating. And uh, and then after they repair the membrane, then they put a gas bubble in your eye. And the whole idea is, is that you lay face down for four days. And that gas bubble wants to float, so it puts pressure on the membrane, and it heals. And then the amazing thing is that your body reproduces the gel that was taken out over a period of two weeks. And so <laughs> I've been watching this bubble in my eye get smaller and smaller until finally, last Thursday it went away. Thank God, now I can get on a plane again. <laughs> and, uh, but during this whole procedure, I wasn't allowed to read for two weeks. And I didn't realize how much I read until I couldn't do it anymore. And no texting, no emails. And so my wife was doing that for me, and she's thankful that I can read again. Because she doesn't have to read and delete all that junk mail for me anymore. So uh, thank you for that care. The check is in the mail. Um, so while I'm going through this procedure, I get... Uh, of course, I've downloaded the Bible, and, and I was able to listen to the scriptures uh, without having to read. And then I, was also, I got a number of books that I was listening to and enjoying, and uh, two books I can recommend if you're a leader, Leadership by John Maxwell, and another one, the, the best book I've ever read on leadership in my life, Dare to Lead. By Brené Brown. Hey. You've read it. Yeah, it's amazing. What an amazing book. It's got some street language in it, but get over that and uh, you'll enjoy the book. The principles are great. So while I'm going through this recovery process, I'm thinking about today and decided what I'll probably have to do, I'll probably have to Memorize my message. And while I was meditating, Psalm 23 came to mind. I thought, well, how boring. Everybody knows Psalm 23. Uh, I mean, goodness, that's the most favorite psalm in the world. It's, uh, you know, it's quoted at weddings, quoted at funerals. It's on more plaques probably than any other psalm there is. And so everybody knows what's going on with Psalm 23, but it would not leave me. And so I, I continued to meditate on it. Of course, I'd memorized it since a child and would go through it in my mind over and over again so that, uh, that I could present it if I still wasn't able to read this week. So anyway, uh, we're going to take a closer look at Psalm 23, if we can, and uh, and I want to describe to you what, what I believe is the intended communication by the author. The author being King David, who had, of course, been a shepherd himself. Uh, some Bibles would call this the shepherd's song. Uh, and David understood, of course, very well the care and protection of a good shepherd. So much so that he defended his sheep even 
against a lion and a bear, which, which is unusual, which is extraordinary for sure. And also, because of his love for the sheep, when it came time for correction in David's life, when the prophet Nathan came to correct him, imagine that assignment. I want you to go correct the king. And, and the way he approached it was with a story about a sheep, about a little lamb. And that so gripped the heart of David that, that as this story was explained to him, he'd become enraged about this man that stole the poor neighbor's lamb. And he became so angry, and then Nathan said, you're the man, talking about David stealing his neighbor's wife. So Psalm 23, simple psalm, we think, until we really look. Only six verses long, and it starts out like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, speaks to me about contentment. Tells me there's no lack. And so as we look at the first few verses of this, we will see that it is God's intention with his people that he be the shepherd. This is the metaphor David was using as he described God's relationship to his people. And so we understand it is God's intent that there be no lack. Then he goes on and he creates this picture. He said, he makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. There's a slide that shows the sheep out in the field, and they're enjoying it. But most of the time when I drive out in the country and see sheep, I always see them grazing. I don't recall any time that I've ever seen them lying down. And yet, as I did some research on it, I come to understand when sheep are well-fed and they're secure, they will lay down, and they will rest. And so this is the picture that David was using to describe the relationship of God to his people. I'm giving you plenty to eat. I'm giving you plenty of water. I've given you security and safety. This is our intended relationship. And then he goes on and he says, he restores my soul. Well, if something needs to be restored, is worn out. Our souls need refreshing. Our souls need restoring. I remember my friend Rachel, Rachel Titus talking about us needing to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. And somebody shouted from the audience, Why? And she says, because we leak. Because we need that fresh infilling, it is intended that it be perpetual. When the disciples came and approached Christ and said, teach us how to pray, he said, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Obviously intended that this would be a daily prayer. I was challenged some years ago as I watched a message by Andy Stanley as he was talking to his father about their prayer life. And Andy talked about, uh, I go to my knees when I pray. And something about that message just, just resonated with me. Uh, I haven't done that since I was a kid. So I made the resolve, okay, I'll try it. You know what? It works. <laughs> I don't know. There's just something about the posture. Do what works for you. I guess Charles Stanley lays down on the floor when he intercedes every day. An amazing thing. By the way, uh, Charles Stanley and his organization has given me hundreds of messengers about the size of this phone that has all the scriptures on it. 60 of his messages in Amharic, in the language, 
And I'm going, of the Ethiopians, I'm going to take them with me to give to pastors when I'm there in September. Isn't that amazing? All a gift from him. And they're solar powered. You leave them in the sun and they power up. Don't even need a pole. How about that? Thank God for Charles Stanley. Doing a great job. He restores my soul. This is ongoing. You get stale real quick when you rely on yesterday's experience. It's got to be fresh. It's got to be new. He guides me in paths of righteousness. Now watch this. For his name's sake. Now it changes. All of this before was him toward me. Now, he says, this is my expectation of you. I lead you in right living. It is for you, but it's really for my name. Here's a news flash. You bear his name. His reputation is based on your conduct. The reputation of his name. Isaiah goes through a strong and powerful explanation of how that the children of Israel had sinned against God and gone against him. And how they had gone into poverty. They had become vagabonds. They had no, they had no land. They had no property. And so they were wandering from place to place, living in tents. And God says, you have become obstinate toward me. You are, you have, he uses this term, you have defiled my holy name. And they go, how did we defile your name? And he says, you have become vagabonds. You are wandering about. You are living in poverty. And the people round about, the nations round about are saying, where is their God? Read it when you go home. These are the children of God, and this is the way he treats them? Are you hearing me today? And so he says, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to restore your farms. I'm going to restore your wine houses. They used to make wine in those days. I am going to restore and prosper you until your property becomes like a garden of Eden. And then he says, I'm not doing this for you. <laughs> it's amazing language. It's just like a slap. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this because you bear my name. And those that bear my name Live right. Oh, man, this is good. Come on, if you can get that in your spirit today, you've got your $2,000 worth. You'll be all right. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I bear his name. And the way I conduct myself is a reflection on him. On his name. Even though. There it gets interesting. Even though I walk through the valley. Of the shadow. Of death. Some things. To pay attention to. He says. Even though I walk through. Notice he did not say. Even though I live. Or I camp. Or I've become so enamored with my disease, I decide to embrace it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. It's scary stuff. Death is nobody's friend. The songwriter said, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And David wrote, and he said, we don't need to be afraid of evil because God is with us. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. 
In order for there to be a shadow, there must be a source of light. So I'm going through, through the valley of the shadow. And when God is with me, I don't fear evil because he brings me through the valley and I overcome the shadow because the closer I get to the light, the less the shadow is. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Somebody said, he's getting through this in a hurry. And I'm going to have grace on you because it's a long weekend and I want you to get to Smitty's before anybody else. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod was for correction and protection. David took care of a bear and a lion with a rod. The staff was a crooked instrument, and it was used for guidance. Sheep tend to wander. They get grazing. They're nearsighted. They can't see far. That's why they need shepherds, because they get wandering off, and then they're away from the flock. I understand in my studies that sheep are most comfortable when they're with a group of 15 others. Fifteen others is critical mass for sheep. I need 14 buds. But they will wander away from them. And then the shepherd goes with this staff, puts it around their neck, draws them back so they can be with their buds again so they don't wander off and go over a cliff. Sheep are peculiar animals. Nearsighted, that's why they need a shepherd. They come up to a stream they look at that, they think it's the ocean. They need a shepherd to lead them across. Fascinating. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They're both used either to prod the sheep or to guide them. Now it gets really interesting. This is probably the most dynamic part of the psalm. I'm going to invite John and Eva over for lunch. I'm not going to go back and find all his enemies and say, why don't you come too? It'd be an uncomfortable lunch. David kind of changes the whole theme of everything that's going on in this psalm and said, now he says this peculiar thing, you prepare a table. And notice the language, it's deliberate. You prepare. A table prepared is effort. It is intentional. I read about the pre president of the U.S. visiting the queen. I was fascinated by that. I like nice things. This was a table prepared. The servants went out with tape measures and measured how far the wine glass was from the center of the dish. Every table. Every setting. The knives, forks, spoons. Everything was in perfect alignment. The wine was $1,600 a bottle. They prepared a table. Now it says, God is preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, why would you ever do that? What are you doing? And when God prepares a table, get around this. He says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Let me explain what happened in the Mediterranean climate. If I walked over to you, if I was an invited guest to your house, or maybe I should reverse it. 
and say, if you are a special guest coming to my house in the Mediterranean times, you would come in, and the first thing that would happen as you came through the door is that one of my servants would come meet you. You would sit down in the entry, and the servant would come with a towel and a basin and would wash your feet. It was a service to your guest because the mode of transportation, of course, was walking. It was a dry climate, and so your feet would get dirty and dusty and hot. The servant would come, wash your feet, and prepare them. You would be refreshed by the washing of your feet. And then another servant would come with a light, fragrant oil. And they would take that oil and they would massage it into your face, into your neck, your hands, all spots, all places that were exposed to the sun. So that you might be refreshed by this fragrant oil. And, and the message that was intuitively presented with that was that your presence is a sweet fragrance in my house. And then another servant would come. You'd get up off your stool where the two servants had taken care of you and they would come and put a goblet. The third servant would come and put a goblet in your hand and would come with a vessel filled with wine. And while you stood in the entry, the servant would pour wine until it ran over. Communicating that you are such a welcome guest that I will go to the point of extravagance to make you welcome. Now here's the burn in this one. David said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I am a welcome guest because you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Can you handle this? Can you handle a God that is so extravagant that he will go to the point of waste for you? Mm. Now that challenges us, doesn't it? Maybe not you, it does me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Why? Because God wants the enemies to know how he treats his guests. And when God prepares a table, it's not nachos and cheese. He prepares a table. The queen would wish that she could prepare such a table. That is God's intention for you. Are you able to receive this today? This thing, this psalm has ministered to me in this past week like I've never experienced it before and is challenging me to a new conduct in my relationship with the Father that has this intention for me. It might sound selfish, I'm not sure, but when I'm aware of his intention, and don't get me going on extravagance because I'll take you through the scripture in case after case after case after case after case where God displayed his extravagance toward his people. One in particular. Go out and let your nets down on the other side. Fifteen fish would have been a treat. Thirty fish would have been dynamic. A hundred fish would have been outstanding, ridiculous. Enough fish to fill two boats until they were sinking? That's extravagant. It's the God I serve. I could go off on that. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What is that about? How does goodness and mercy follow you? How does that take place? I suggest to you it's called reputation. And it follows you all the days of your life. 
while you're still living. Not after you're dead and people applaud you and say nice things about you. But while you're alive. Goodness and mercy. Follow me. I got reputation. And then he goes on and talks about eternity. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a deal. What an amazing psalm. Oh, I want to live that. And we pray, Father, how we thank you. Thank you for this amazing promise. I thank you for a little glimpse that our minds can try to conceive exactly how you wish us to live in relationship with you. We want our reflection of you to be a delight. We want to be a sweet fragrance. We want to be that person that understands all that you mean in our life. And so that we represent you well. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for taking time to listen to today's message. If you are encouraged or challenged by what you heard today, please let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Send us your story to my story at jubileecalgary.com. You can also invest in the lives of others by partnering with us financially. Your gift can impact many as God works through your generosity to help us continue sharing this message with others. Donations can be given online at jubileecalgary.com backslash give. Your feedback and giving are truly appreciated.